Welcome to St Andrews, or at least to our YouTube channel. My name's Steve Frederick. I'm one of the ministers here at the Cathedral, particularly looking after the evening congregation. Rather than simply recording a full service and then streaming it online during this COVID-19 period, the evening congregation is meeting together online each Sunday, about five o'clock, via an app called Zoom. While we can't be physically present with each other, Meeting in Zoom at least allows us to see and encourage each other face to face until we're able to meet in person once again. This video is the teaching segment that goes into making up a broader Zoom meeting. We do hope that this sermon will be a great encouragement to you. But even more than that, we'd like you to join us on Zoom so we can also be encouraged by your joining with us. Now, if you'd like to do that, just send me an email and I'll get in contact to introduce myself and to pass on the login details for our online Sunday afternoon meetings. Of course, even more, we're looking forward to finally meeting you in person just as soon as it's safe to hold our public gatherings once again. Last week we saw that Ruth the Moabite, that despised outsider, sought refuge under the protective wings of Israel's God. And in doing so, she just so happened, we're told, to find herself in the fields of Boaz, a man who not only had pity upon her as a widow, but also someone who extended to her the kind of care that would normally be reserved for someone just from your own household. Now, the kindness of Boaz was an act of grace. It was an act that astonished Ruth. It was even an act of grace that began to dispel Naomi's own ingrained bitterness about her return to God and her return to Israel. But Boaz's stunning generosity was at best just a temporary solution to the deep anxieties and insecurity that these two women faced. After all, Ruth could only gather food from Boaz's field during the harvest time. And the harvest was quickly coming to an end. Ruth and Naomi would need more than just some seasonal handouts if they were to secure their long-term survival. Now, Naomi's response to the ongoing insecurity of both herself and Ruth is found at the opening verses to chapter 3. Have a look with me. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying, then go, uncover his feet, and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Well, lipstick, check. Alluring clothes, check. Plenty of alcohol, check, check. Maybe it's not quite that seedy, but you get the general idea. Seduction is in the air. It appears that Naomi's solution to the problem of herself and Ruth is to seduce the unsuspecting Boaz. Mind you, uncovering someone's feet in the middle of the night while they're trying to sleep hardly sounds very seductive, strikes me as more annoying than arousing. But it's clear that this move was intended as a proposition for sex. In fact, Isaiah 57 uses this same sexualized language to describe the indecent advances that Israel, the nation Israel, made towards the gods of their pagan neighbors. In fact, Naomi's questionable plan here reminds me of a similar situation that's described in the book of Genesis. About 800 years or so earlier than the story of Ruth that we're looking at now, another woman, just like Ruth, had found herself without a husband or a son to care for her. And her solution, the solution to her own anxiety and her desperate need, was actually to get her own father drunk so that she could seduce him and conceive a child who might look after her in her old age. And from this lady was descended the entire nation of Moab, 
which you'll remember just happens to be Ruth's own nationality. Out of an anxiety for their future security, it looks like Naomi's plan is for Ruth to trick Boaz into getting her pregnant, perhaps, just as her immoral Moabite ancestor had done once before. That's so often how anxiety misleads us, isn't it? Anxiety tells us these powerful lies that God isn't attentive to us, that disobedience is the only way to secure peace and happiness for ourselves. Now, being the honourable woman that she is, Ruth doesn't go all the way with Naomi's suspiciously Moabite-like plan. Have a look with me at how Ruth proceeds with the plan in chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. I am your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. Spread the corner of your garment over me. It's a bit of a strange request, isn't it, given the situation? But this isn't simply a request for Boaz to share more of the blanket, more of the bed covers with Ruth. Literally, Ruth is saying, spread your wings over me. It's the same phrase that Boaz had used back in chapter 2 when he commends Ruth for seeking protection under God's protective wings. Notice that the reason Ruth is asking Boaz for protection is because he is a guardian redeemer. A guardian redeemer was a close relative who was expected to look after the widows in his own family, to pay their way out of financial trouble if they were ever to find themselves in that kind of trouble and difficulty. Sometimes this even meant going as far as marrying the widow to guarantee that she had a future security, that her future within the clan, within the family was secured. And this is what Ruth is asking of Boaz. Now, as it turns out, Boaz seems pretty happy with the marriage proposal. And at first, it looks like the story is on its way to a happy ending. But of course, as with all the best stories, there's a catch. The story takes a twist, and we find out that there's an unexpected problem with Ruth's request. You see, there's another guardian redeemer who is a closer relative to Ruth than Boaz himself is. The responsibility to look after a widow fell to the widow's closest relative. And so Boaz can't accept Ruth's proposal, at least not as it is. It seems the marriage plan has hit a wall. Perhaps Ruth would have been better just to have seduced Boaz as Naomi seems to have originally intended. Although Naomi's plan is sunk, Boaz has a plan of his own. And it's a clever plan at that. Boaz actually goes on to organise an official meeting at the city gates. And he invites this other relative, the legitimate guardian redeemer, to come to this meeting with him. We read about Boaz's plan, at least the beginning of it, uh, and the meeting at the city gate in chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Have a look there with me. Chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he, that is the guardian redeemer, went over and sat down with Boaz. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, Sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. 
for no one has the right to do it except you and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said, that is the other guardian redeemer answered. Whenever poverty forced a widow to sell their bit of the promised land, it was the responsibility of the closest relative, the guardian redeemer, to buy back that land for the family, to redeem it for her, for the widow, to make sure that the land was kept within her family. And, well, it seems that the other guardian redeemer is interested in this deal that Boaz is proposing. And, and that's actually hardly surprising. You see, since Naomi had no living children, once she was dead and out of the picture, the land would become his land permanently, the guardian redeemer's land permanently. And this sounds exactly like the kind of deal he could get excited about. And so he accepts, I will redeem Naomi's land. I'll buy it back. However, Boaz realizes that this man is actually more interested in helping himself than in helping out Naomi. And so Boaz goes on to bring up a second matter for discussion, one that the man might not be quite so interested in carrying out. Have a look with me at verse 5 of chapter 4. Verse 5. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it, because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. As soon as Boaz mentions that marrying the Moabite woman is part of the deal, the deal doesn't look so good to this relative, and he starts to backpedal. You see, this guy wanted the wealth without the responsibility of protecting these helpless women, in helping them. You see, the law of Israel stated that if this man was to marry Ruth and have a son, then legally he wouldn't own the land at all. The son would. He would spend all of his own money in redeeming Naomi's land for the family, but he himself wouldn't end up personally profiting a cent from all of his effort from the deal. Well, once the other relative refuses to fulfill this role of guardian redeemer for Naomi and Ruth, that means that Boaz and Ruth are now free to marry. Boaz has fulfilled his promise to secure Ruth's future for her. The outworking of the story, the result of Boaz's plan, is recorded for us there in verse 13 of chapter 4. Let's read. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. I wonder if you noticed that there were two elements, there were two aspects to Boaz's redeeming of Ruth and Naomi. Boaz redeems Ruth from poverty for a start, but Boaz also redeems Ruth in order that she might be his wife. See, Boaz is far more than just an inspiring example of charity. Not only is the story of Ruth and Naomi a beautiful story, it also movingly parallels God's surprising kindness towards us as well. In fact, in the closing verses that we just read of the book of Ruth, we learn that Boaz and Ruth, the Moabitess, are the great-grandparents of King David. And of course, King David's greatest descendant is the Lord Jesus himself. In fact, in Matthew's Gospel, Ruth is included in Jesus' own genealogy, his history of his family, where women are almost never included. Ruth is. The ultimate outsider has become the ultimate insider. In fact, in his letter to Titus in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul describes Jesus 
in words that might remind us something of Boaz. From Titus, Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people of his very own. Boaz redeemed Ruth from the crushing burden of poverty. Jesus redeems us from God's judgment upon our own wickedness. Boaz redeems Ruth from the shame of her Moabite heritage. Jesus redeems and purifies us from the shame that lurks in our own personal backstories. But more than all of that, Boaz redeems Ruth for a wife, to be a wife, just as the Lord Jesus does for his own people. We who had the least claim upon Jesus' kindness, Jesus unites himself with us in the kind of intimacy that even husband and wives rarely experience to the full. I wonder if you recall the way in which Naomi had attempted to matchmake Ruth and Boaz. And Naomi had instructed Ruth to wash, to cleanse herself. Naomi had instructed Ruth to dress herself in her most alluring clothing. Naomi had instructed Ruth to wait until Boaz was well and truly drunk, all in the vain hope that they could trick Boaz into a situation in which he'd have to show Ruth kindness. But it turns out, Ruth didn't need to manipulate Boaz into anything. Boaz loves Ruth with his eyes wide open, both to who Ruth actually is and to what marrying her is going to cost him. And he proceeds more than willingly. And friends, that's how the Lord Jesus loves us also. See, we don't need to somehow prove ourselves pure to Jesus, for he himself will cleanse us. We don't need to dress ourselves in religious fancy dress to distract Jesus from our own failings and private shame. Jesus chooses to settle his own loving kindness upon us while he is fully sober to exactly what and who we are. Praise be to the Lord God, who this day, tonight, has not left us without a guardian redeemer in the Lord Jesus. One who will renew us in life and sustain us even beyond old age and beyond death itself. Amen.